So welcome everyone to the Emerging Trends in Cloud Engineering panel that will focus on platform as product, platform APIs, developer self-service, and more. We have a fantastic lineup of panelists today, genuinely privileged to be amongst these folks, including Alex Jones, Brian Gracely, Katie Gamanji, and Victor Farsek. I'll let them introduce themselves in just a second. I'm your host, Daniel Bryant. I'm currently Director of DevRel at Ambassador Labs, where I focus on helping engineers build platforms and deliver applications on Kubernetes. So could we go around the room, please, and quick introduction of who you are? Katie, should I start with you? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Gamanji, and currently I am the Ecosystem Advocate at CNCF, or Cloud Native Computing Foundation. I have been in this role for almost half a year, having my first anniversary there, well, half anniversary. And my responsibility within this role is to pretty much lead the end user community. So these are the vendor neutral organizations that use cloud native tooling, but at the same time to bridge the gap between these practitioners and the projects within the ecosystem. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna finish up with this one. Perfect, Brian, you wanna go next? Sure, um, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Gracely. I'm Senior Director of Product Strategy at Red Hat, uh, primarily for the OpenShift platform, so our Kubernetes platform. Uh, and on the side, I host the uh, the Cloudcast podcast. Brilliant. Victor, you're next in my box lineup. Okay, so uh, I work in Shippa. I'm a developer advocate there. I do not yet know what I'm going to do there because I'm about to join tomorrow. Uh, so something in Shippa. I have a YouTube channel and uh, I don't know, I published a few books. That's all. Superb. Alex, last but by no means least. Um, hi, I'm Alex. I'm a principal engineer at Sivo. Uh, Sivo is a cloud computing provider built on K3s. Uh, I build hyperconverged infrastructure all the way up to operators, all the way up to tenant application architecture. Uh, I also work a little bit with uh, SIG app delivery and, and observability. Excellent, excellent. Appreciate all well, that. Sounds perfect. So we'll start off by asking the question of what does a modern platform, or I often say PaaS, platform as a service, look like? We had the rise of infrastructure as code, containers, Kubernetes, and many of us are hankering back to the days of Heroku, of Cloud Foundry, where it was Git push master and we were good to go, right? What do, what do you all think a modern PaaS encompasses? I think we do not have it yet. We will soon. I believe that that's the next step in evolution of Kubernetes. I mean, we know that that modern platform is going to be Kubernetes based. That's certain today. And I think that we are just starting uh, building platforms like that. And when I say platforms like that, I mean Heroku like, right? Because I think that there is some kind of misconception that developers will adopt Kubernetes. I think that that will never happen. It's too complex for vast majority of people and uh, uh, 2021 will be probably a year where we will see emergence of platforms that uh, layers on top of Kubernetes. Actually, I, uh, I actually am of the same uh, opinion here. I think there is always like an evolution cycle we go around when it comes to deploying uh, applications. We had this cycle when it came to the VMs. So pretty much how can we make best use of our compute at the time? We had the configuration as code that was heavily dominated by tools such as Ansible or Salt at the time. And I think we kind of go undergoing the same patterns, but with, the, with different technology. That's where we have Kubernetes coming around. And now we, again, making the best usage of our space, but now we're using containers and they pretty much the Linux primitives, the Linux kernel primitives with C groups and namespaces. We um, have different ways to describe our configuration from plain YAML, we transition to templating with Helm charts. Now we have CRDs to further customize the experience of our developers. And now I think we are at a moment where we treat, like we have, the, we have the ecosystem there, we have the technology, but now we're trying to make the best of it to really enrich the developer experience. I think how can we deploy easier to have that competitive edge towards like a technology or a business? It, it's interesting just to follow from Katie's uh, statement there that Kelsey Hightower came out with a really great sort of uh, sentence around that most people want, want a PaaS, but the requirement is it has to be built by them, right? So taking all these commodity tools and wrapping it into your own kind of flavor to give you your own PaaS. And I thought that was kind of, kind of a, a good take on it, right? Yeah, I, I would build on top of that. I think that most companies do that. And after a couple of years, they realize that they failed. <laughs> and yes, then, then they're looking for a real path. 
Yeah, we, we always kind of come back and forth between this. Um, you know, I think James Governor the other day was joking on, on Twitter. He said, everybody that's building platforms is trying to replicate Heroku. I, I think it's a little different. I think the spectrum is a little bigger. I think on one end, there is a set of developers or a set of work use cases that are looking for really highly opinionated and even maybe more so than Heroku, like what Netlify does or, you know, Cloud Run or, or Lambda or something. But then there's, there's the other part of it, which is, do we want to sort of proliferate uh, opinionated platforms? And, and so we see things like, you know, with Kubernetes, we see operators let us run databases and AI and ML workloads. And so that to me is more the, the question is like, are you looking for highly opinionated sort of one-off platforms? And, and those will fit certain use cases. Or do you want something, you know, Kubernetes gives us a foundation to do a lot of things. Is that a better way to solve, you know, the, the breadth of problems that most companies have? I like that, Brian. And that actually leads nicely on, thank you everyone, but that leads nicely on to the next question is, we frequently now talk about platform as a product. It should be designed as a product, managed as a product, and released and controlled as a product, which I totally buy into in my, my day job. How does the implementation of this differ from the traditional approaches many of you have sort of mentioned? Well, I think from my own experience, there's a bias towards reuse and proliferation these days. Um, platform as a product is essentially a way of mandating and ensuring your, your survival within the ecosystem and that you are wrapping up all of the domain specific knowledge and the components that you need to be successful. And, you know, I think of some of these, uh, you know, aforementioned products that are really popular in the ecosystem and Heroku really being kind of the, the nostalgic gold standard. But if you were to rebuild Heroku in a Kate-based environment, it would look very, very different. And I think that it's really uh, imperative that we understand that there is no panacea currently. And really, when we think about platform as a product currently, it's something that is extensible, right? So that there can be community reuse as well as building on top of. Uh, and we've seen many of those already today. The, the place where I think that many or one of the main reasons why many platforms failed in, in the past is I believe that they all tended to go to extremes, either be extremely opinionated and satisfy, let's say, developers and completely leave operators and sysadmins and SREs, you know, people who are making sure that systems are running properly uh, unsatisfied, or like Kubernetes is today, that it satisfies one group and it doesn't satisfy the other, right? So it usually goes into extreme, extremely opinionated, doesn't work for uh, sysadmins, works for sysadmins, developers cannot use it. And that's why I believe that we are now in a good spot that we have that, we have Kubernetes, it does satisfy sysadmins, it does what it needs to do. And what we are missing is that layer on top. That, that's why I believe Heroku in a way failed or Docker Swarm failed as well. They started with, from that, other direction. Let's start with making it easy for people, instead of making actually making it have all the all the levers that it needs to have before we build that that abstraction layer that that will satisfy the other group of people. And, and nobody did that in the past, really, or at least very few. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting as we, as we get into thinking about it as a product. We've we've sort of moved past the idea of like is the decision sort of uh, buy versus build something yourself, right? Take a lot of the parts together. And, and now it's, it's more a matter of like, uh, if I have a platform, whether it's you consume it as a managed service or you consume it as software, it's does, does the, the way that that thing is delivered as a platform meet your needs? So like as an example, so there was a thread on, on I think Hacker News yesterday or the day before that was, you know, Kubernetes is really complicated because it comes out so frequently. How do I keep up with updates? And, and one side of the argument was, well, who cares? Just spin up another cluster and move your stateless applications over there. And when you put that sort of response in front of anybody who does anything stateless, it, you know, it's somewhere between, you know, or, you know, kind of facepalm. And, and I think we need to realize like delivering the platform is really important, delivering updates and making it simple for people to consume. But, but there's even parts of that, that that are hard for people, right? Like the three or four month cycle of Kubernetes is really hard for an organization that has an application they don't touch nearly as quickly, right? There is an aspect of that that's you know, lift and shift or modernize. So I, I, again, I think there's, there's sort of these, these shades of gray in between stuff that if you make it all one kind of definition, it makes it hard 
to like like Victor mentioned, you know, like it doesn't apply, it applies to one side but not the other necessarily. I think on that point, I'll I'll skip a, a few of the questions I've initially talked about and look at the open application model, uh, the the OAM spec. One thing I've just sort of heard you all talk about, and one thing that really stood out to me in the OAM spec is this clear definition of personas. So it's gone through a few iterations, but now it's focused on component owners, which for me are kind of the developers, application operators, kind of SRE-like, I think, site reliability engineering-like, and infrastructure operators, which for me are the kind of classic platform folks, the sysadmin folks. Do you, and I do like the, the three distinct personas rather than the classic perhaps dev and ops thing. Do you all see that in your day jobs? Do you see perhaps the three personas there? Do you like that part of the OAM spec? Well, well, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. So, so I can speak a little from a, a financial perspective where there's a highly regulated set of protocols to which you have to follow. And you know, it, it very much is reflected in there being a clear distinction between operational staff who can touch clusters, who can, you know, deal with infrastructure, who can debug, then the SRE who, team who may well be, you know, observing telemetry and making iterations on application code. And then you've got their counterparts who are the development cycle team. And if you were to draw sort of a Venn diagram, these all touch slightly, you know, between the three groups. And so it is nice seeing a recognition there. And the thing that I really like about the spec is that it looks to sort of unite the, the the users and the platform builders right within a single a single specification. So it's it very much is reflective of what we're seeing uh, in the industry. I can actually bring an example from my past roles as well, and I think this kind of segregation between different roles and different personas that happened organically for us, um, which was quite luckily. But initially, we started as one team, which provisioned infrastructure as a service, um, and that's if we're looking at the team topologies, that's going to be a type three. And at that point, we would just pretty much build for the demand we have uh, from our developers straight away. However, there is not too much of upskilling going on. There is not too much. Uh, of support that we could provide continuously. And that kind of transition into a, um, a team, actually our team divided, where we have our platform team, which just focus on the infrastructure uh, provisioning. And then we had our cloud management team, which would focus on that ops kind of culture. And towards the end, we moved towards the SRE model, uh, where we have an SRE team included as well. And then we have this kind of collaboration when it comes to we don't just provision platform, we upscale, but at the same time, we can push back on feature development. And based on the SLOs, we can bring things that um, would really empower our teams forever. Now, why I'm saying that is that all of these kind of free teams that we have, um, it was an organic kind of development of all of these personas that we see enforced by the open application model as well. And at the time, we had to provision all these components. We had to create our own methodologies and pretty much bring build the tooling or bring in the tooling in-house, which will allow us to deliver this particular um, or to deploy our application using these models. Now with, uh, with this spec, it's already there. So it's kind of nice to see this further confirmed within the community, but at the same time, it brings a benchmark and a standard, which means that now we have the fundamentals, we just need to build on top of it. And this truly um, enables more extensibility um, and pretty much is a good model that every team can build on top of. Yeah, I, I think what Katie, I think what Katie highlights in, in, in reality is, is that middle, that middle tier, that middle identity is the one that's going to end up being the most fluid, right? On, on at any given time, they may be more infrastructure oriented, um, especially if let's say you're moving an application from on-premises into the cloud, for example, or even cloud to cloud. And then at other times they're they're going to have to be sort of more the application centric SRE. So, but but I think the the, the thing I really love about it is. It is very distinct to say, um, you know, it's not sort of, you know, one way or the other. They, there's some flexibility in there. I think um, that's, but like you said, the, the fact that we're sort of writing it down, we're sort of making it a structured model that allows you to think within a certain framework and it's not just completely nebulous. What I believe is kind of missing from that description is describing who, who are users of each of those groups. Uh, which is of, often overlooked. They tend to be in a silo, right? Uh, I'm in charge of infrastructure. I'm in charge of this or that. Well, I believe that the, the real move forward is that to acknowledge that application SREs, application operators, infrastructure operators, they are, their users are developers. They, they're, they're supposed to build services 
that can be consumed by developers. They're not supposed to re actually really create infrastructure. They're not supposed to deploy any applications. They're supposed to create tools, patterns, means for developers to be self-sufficient. I, I don't think, I, I don't see it as much uh, right now in the industry, but I believe that's the direction we need to go. Very interesting, very interesting. So, so I jumped ahead and I probably should have introduced the OAM spec, but uh, dialing back a second, and I think a few of you touched on these ideas as well. How important do you believe open standards are to creating a platform? I can definitely answer this one. It's mainly because I've been focused on this particular topic for, for a while now. And I have been um, trying to really pinpoint what was the impact of emerging emer emergence of interfaces within the Kubernetes ecosystem. But now I'm focused on the open standards when it comes not just to the application delivery, uh, but to observability side, because we have projects such as open matrix and open tracing, which really tries to bring that again fundamentals to how we exactly would collect metrics or how we deploy our application. And uh, there are three main things that I usually identify when it comes to open standards or pretty much the fundamentals. They impact the vendors, the end users, and of course the community. For the vendors, it's gonna be um, pretty much innovation because as a vendor, you don't have to concern yourself how can you merge your components with uh, the platform, the standards are already gonna be there. So as a vendor, you can focus on how to deliver value to the customers with minimal latency. So you really focus on, um, on your customers and what you can bring to them straight away. For the end users on the other side, when, when you're talking about open standards, it means um, extensibility. Now, what it actually means here is that as an end user, you can choose multiple tools with the same, um, well, kind of trying to save, solve the same problem, but you can benchmark between them. And it's easier now because you have that one platform with the standards integrated or the interfaces already available, you just inter-switch in between them. And of course, when you're looking into the entire ecosystem, that pretty much translates into interoperability, which means that we have an ecosystem which is quite colorful in terms of the technologies out there. But more importantly, again, we have multiple solutions for the same problem. And this is really, I think, the driving force of the, um, pretty much the extensibility and um, kind of the growth, organic growth within the cloud native ecosystem we have now. Just to add to, to Katie's points there, I mean, around open tracing and open census, you know, merging into open telemetry for end users like myself, it means that we can use the hotel collector and have a guarantee that there is a sort of a longevity to this project and that vendors are coming together to design a solution that will um, benefit the users and also allow us uh, a degree of choice, right? In that if vendors are compliant and they conform to these, these protocols and these specifications, then we know that we can have this path to migration, uh, whatever should we choose to do in terms of our, our business direction. So it's wonderful to see that kind of collaboration and that's only made possible through these kind of standards that are being, being built out. Yeah, I, I, think, I think both of you guys, both of you point out something that's, that's sort of indirectly important. We used to do standards, we'd have these think standards bodies, the IEEE or uh, WC3 or whatever. The, the nice thing about them being community-based now and, and especially open source based is you not only get standards uh, that come with code, but, but to a certain extent, sort of the economic viability of those standards work themselves out. So like open telemetry is a great example, um, but there, you know, there's been others. And, and for, for people that are customers or users of it, they want to know that as much as, as they want to know that it's a standard, right? They're, they're betting on a technology they want to know, is it going to be around for a while? Is there going to be people that support this? I don't want it to be fragmented because it's not good for, it's not good for Alex's business model. It's not good for anybody else's business model. So I think we've reached a point now where it's evolved, where it's, it's not only the standard, which is great, but we get code, but there's also a certain amount of sort of uh, economic Darwinism, if you will. So you know that the thing that you ultimately pick is going to be more viable than just paper specs like we used to have back in the day. Very nice. I've working from a Java background. I can definitely recommend the uh, or definitely recognize the paper specs, <laughs> right? Like EJBs and so forth. So yeah, very good, very good. I think as a sort of wrapping up question now, we've covered sort of some of the APIs and the benefits of specs. I'd love to get your thoughts on whether Kubernetes is somewhat becoming a centralized control plane. You know, these days, it's sort of almost a universal control plane, I guess. It's the rise of custom resources, operators. I think you've already mentioned, Brian. What do you think? In relation to that, do you think Kubernetes is becoming a universal control plane for modern platforms? You know, for, for, for some, yeah, for having done this for, for a while with Kubernetes, I, I think it is. I think it's a, 
I think of it as more of sort of a foundation for what's going to build on those control planes. So whether that control plane is, is at the service mesh level, whether it's sort of this cross networking thing like Submariner and, and other projects, I think it's a, it's a really, really good foundation. And what's going to get interesting with it is, um, it, you know, does the control plane, is it, is it multi-cloud? Is it sort of cloud to edge? That's where I think we've got a lot of flexibility, but the, the nice piece is we're not, we're not kind of shifting the underlying sand. So I, I feel really good about that. And I think, you know, like we're coming up into KubeCon, but KubeCon, we used to call it KubeCon because that was the dominant technology. Now Cube is sort of the, the, the sort of safe and boring piece of the pieces. And, uh, you know, it, it's control plane con and what will that evolve to, which is really exciting. I can only echo that, to be honest. I think the most powerful characteristic when it comes to Kubernetes is the fact that it's non-opinionated. It has some assertiveness when it comes, for example, for networking model, like every single call should have an IP. However, it is not assertive when it comes to the underlying technology that Kubernetes run on top of. And this has been quite powerful because you have a methodology that allows you to lift and shift your application pretty much anywhere. And over the time, there has been this build integration where you can deploy this easily on the edge nowadays, well, actually now it's on the edge, but it, it came with the public cloud on-premise and more, more prominently now towards the edge, as I mentioned. Um, and this again uh, has been very, very um, maybe empowered by the fact that Kubernetes allows a very good set of primitives. And based on top of that, you can have these building blocks principles where you have already components that are working that are stable and you can build on top of them. And I think it has been mentioned um, many times that I think Kubernetes again is gonna become the, the basic, it's gonna be the boring as Brian mentioned. Um, and this again has been seen by um, the fact that the Kubernetes uh, source code has been changed for our time because at the beginning it would had everything integrated within it. So for example, the runtime component would be very deeply integrated there. Same with the storage, but now these are components which develop completely independently. They have their own landscape and they own pretty much vendors and community around it. So just based on that, we see that Kubernetes is getting slimmer, like the binaries for, for the uh, Kubernetes. And I think this is the way to go forward. Becoming slimmer, it means it's out there, it's stable, it's reliable, and people can use, reuse it for anything that they can build on top of. And I think there is, um, I think Kelsey Hightower mentioned this, Kubernetes is a platform to build other platforms. So I think this kind of encapsulates that quite nicely. And this also reminds me, Katie, of one of your keynotes around the interoperability of the components of Kubernetes and around the uh, you know, CNI, for example, where it's essentially like a train station where people can come and you know, build out their ideas and figure out where they want to go from it. And I, I think that's a, the beauty of it is that we're now we see, especially with the latest generation of operator mechanisms being brought into that ecosystem people are doing all sorts of provisioning and so yeah it's it's a great uh, it's a great kind of meeting place to start building out that platform as you said any other ideas from anyone there victor you've been quiet on that one? Oh, on that one no i, I i'm quiet mostly because i, I completely agree i i, I don't Usually, people associate Kubernetes as uh, with the machine that runs containers. To me, that's definitely not the main benefit. It's all about its API. It's about mm -hmm. its scheduler. And we see, I mean, we can see already that in action. Uh, people are running uh, Mac farms uh, based on uh, Kubernetes API, right? Or, or control plane. Uh, we've seen with uh, cross plane uh, managing your infrastructure with, uh, again, with cross plane, with API and so on and so forth. I mean, we've been scheduling VMs as if they're containers as well, right? So I, I would even make a prediction that Kubernetes control plane will outlive containers even, right? Mm. That, that's, that's, that's the real the real power of Kubernetes is in a control plane, not in the fact that it can run containers in, in your cluster. Great insight there, great insight. So I definitely put sort of in the in the show notes, the reference uh, links to the OAM and cross plane there, and there's Kube Vale, which is a reference implementation of Kube Vale, I'm not sure how we pronounce that one yet. But yeah, I'm definitely with you, Victor. I, I believe that the API is probably the, a, a good API often outlives the implementation, right? As a final outro question, we're coming dangerously close to time now. I'd like to get like the tweet size version, right? So 280 characters of where you think the most innovation in software delivery is going to happen in the next five years. Is it languages? I like saw dark lang, things like that. Is it architectures, dreaded nano services, or is it platforms? Things like serverless platforms built on top of, um, say, and, and other abstractions in terms of using the control plane, the Kubernetes control plane. 
is it yeah perhaps platforms that are going to be the most exciting so languages architectures or platforms where's the most innovation going to come from katie i'm going to pick you i was actually hoping you wouldn't because i'm i think like all of these areas are going to be uh quite uh in development within the next years but I'm actually quite biased in this perspective. I because I've been following the platform space uh, for for a while now. I'm be following it quite closely. I think here is uh, where there's a lot of dynamics. But again, I'm saying this from my own uh, kind of bubble of technologists um, around uh, this area. So I think when it comes to the platforms, I think there is definitely um, an improvement when it comes to how we use uh, the platforms, how we deliver that uh, developer excellence, operational excellence simplifying it we still are hang, like hanging around yaml manifests which we shouldn't and we even try to push this to our developers it's still the case i think moving away from that um, is definitely going to be a step forward and personally i'm quite excited to see how we can use some of these platforms to deliver these applications to the edge this is something again which i'm following quite closely but i would like to see how this can be achieved seamlessly but at the same time to ensure that um, kind of abstracted propagation of applications to uh, closer, well, to areas closer to the users pretty much at the edge. So awesome. yeah, from my perspective, it's going to be the platforms. But again, my view is biased here. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, can I ask you? Um, yeah, I, I think I'm going to place my vote in the architecture space. I think the, the biggest changes I've seen in, in the Kubernetes space or even just the, the cloud native community over the last five years have all been, um, you know, people pushing the boundaries on what you can run on these environments, uh, what you can distribute, um, how big or how small. Um, and I think we're gonna keep seeing that. So whether it's you know, architectures to make apps simpler or architectures to, uh, to you know, sort of deliver applications across multiple environments, I think we're gonna keep seeing that, uh, that expand quickly. Super, Victor, you're next in the box. That's all right. I would go with platforms and languages over architecture. Mm -hmm. I somehow feel that architecture always follows those two, right? Like if you, if you look at, let's say microservices, nobody really, I mean, very few did them until we got containers that enabled it, right? So platforms and languages are usually enablers for, for different architectures. So, I mean, we will definitely see improvements in all three of those, but if I would need to place them in order, I would say that the architecture follows platforms. Bit of disagreement, fascinating. I like that. This is good. It's been a, such a nice panel, right? We need some disagreement. Alex, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. I think that it is a, a, a quiet rebellion happening in the platform space where the price point of commodity infrastructure, um, you know, KEMU and KVM virtualization mixed with things like KubeVirt with Kubernetes and other platforms means that people can now assemble their own cloud providers combined with the fact that developer experience is you know, really a, a hungered for offering, we're going to see in the next five years that there are competitors to, to uh, Google and to AWS. And we're going to see that we're now starting to get developer centric platforms being built with Kate's just as a pure API and no more than that. So I think that it's going to be the community and the engineers that are guiding the next generation of, of innovation here. And that is a fantastic way to end the panel, I think. Thank you to all of you. It's been super interesting. We'll do some Q&A, hopefully in the live event as well. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for having us.